So looking at these different rasters, um, it's kind of a light show. It's a little bit of a laser show. It's going to be confusing maybe, but try to get used to what these different rasters look like. The default for Q, uh, QGIS is to make a grayscale black to white uh, color scheme, but a lot of times we change the color scheme so it makes more sense to our own brains. Um, in this case, this is just a raw digital elevation model, which is kind of the basis for most raster, uh, most elevation rasters and terrain rasters come from this one type of image where we start with zero, which is usually sea level, and it's kind of where the datum sits, and then every Z value off of that, the, the pixel value for each pixel on the raster is a, is a vertical measurement of elevation either above or in the case of bathymetry below the datum line at zero. So I would call this a continuous raster because it has uh, every single pixel has a unique value and not necessarily unique but they're independently measured and um, it kind of represents a, a, a continuous surface it's interval data, right? Zero is, f is not arbitrary, but we are setting zero at sea level. If we were going to make a bathymetric map at high tide or low tide or that kind of thing, then you can see how zero might be set differently. In this case, zero is the ocean, and it just goes up in meters, where every pixel is just a different um, measurement of that. So, very simple. It's kind of hard to understand um, the actual topography and the feel of the landscape with just a raw dig digital elevation model. We can see where, oh, there must be a stream there, these must be mountains, um, because in this case black is low and it goes through gray to white, which is high. Um, but, you know, if we want to represent the landscape a little more effectively, we use what's called a hillshade. And a hillshade is also white and black values, but here the light values are just 0 to 255 and 255 is white and that this is where we're pretending to cast light across the surface so that we can kind of get a three-dimensional feel for the landscape the hillshade isn't really used then to do analysis it's usually just used in cartography the cartography helps us see the landscape as a human would understand it the light is being cast from 300 degrees which is kind of west northwest um, and they're 30 degrees above we due west, which is 270, 40 degrees off the horizon, and you can choose whichever direction you want to cast light from, but in general, people um, for a long time have been casting light from the upper left, and there's studies that are done that, that show that the average human, for some reason, uh, tends to see three-dimensional objects best in this kind of schema. You could cast light from the lower right instead, but I think a lot of people might misinterpret your map and what looks like a hill right now might accidentally look more like a divot. So you just have to be careful about how you use hillshade, but you're free to experiment, of course. But let's say we wanted to measure something else in the landscape, not just hillshade um, or kind of what are the raw elevation values. We can measure uh, slope, and slope is a funny looking raster. This is also black being a low value and white being a high value. But in this case, the low does not literally mean low because we're no longer measuring elevation. We're measuring slope. So a low slope would be a flat place. So for instance, these lakes have a slope of zero. The ocean has a slope of zero. Um, whereas the edge of the mountain, however, has a high slope value. And the default in QGIS is to measure slope in degrees. So the high here is probably somewhere in the 20s or 30s, maybe a couple higher than that. But you can kind of see, oh, that's a steep slope right there, right? Here's Maguntacook or one of those mountains down there, steep slopes down there. And you can change the symbology, but this is also the kind of default way that we see this. So now what are we looking at? Now this is kind of a trick question um, because we're still looking at just the digital elevation model. But what I wanted to stress here was that unlike this one, we've decided that instead of going from black to white, we're going to go from green through yellow to tan or through tan to kind of a, a whitish color. And when we do that, when we make color a uh, different representation based on its elevation, it's called a, a hypsometric tint. And the hypsometric tint is just a way that we have of saying, okay, let's make it look a little bit more meaningful to human minds. Now we're starting to see, oh, okay, maybe the lower elevations 
are more lush and the higher elevations are drier. Um, it's a it's a pretty big assumption, but it helps to to give the brain um, a little more than black and white to kind of understand the landscape. So, a hypsometric tint is the way we color a di digital elevation model, even though it's the same data, it appears different, and the color helps the brain interpret the landscape. But we have to be careful because sometimes people interpret those colors as land cover, and you just need to be sure that um, you're properly representing what's being seen on the ground. So, uh, moving on. This is an aspect raster. An aspect is a measurement of the direction a slope faces from 0 to 360, where 0 is north, 90 is east, 180 is south, 270 is west, and 360 is right back to due north again. So in this case, I've, re, I've kind of changed the color scheme a bit. It comes in a black and white value as well, but I've changed it so that red is both the 360 and the 0. And then it kind of go through, goes through all the spectrum uh, where 180 is, is in the kind of green-blue region, uh, yellow being east and kind of indigo being west. And you'll notice that there's also black, but I'm hoping maybe you can guess, like, what do you think, why do you think there's a, why do you think there's black here? Well, black is uh, kind of no data. If something's completely flat, then its aspect is straight up towards the zenith. And you can't represent that with uh, 0 to 360 because those are just all angular directions. So in this case, black represents no data, which we interpret to mean it's completely flat in those locations. And these locations are almost always kind of lakes or things like that. So the next type of raster that I want to talk about is called a Boolean raster. And this Boolean raster that I'm going to show you comes directly from this raster. And Boolean is just a true-false. It's only zeros and ones. And what it means is we're asking a logical question. So in this case, I said, I want places that are only less than 90 from this raster. So if I do that and I say, all places where aspect is less than 90, I'm going to get a swath of this raster that returns a true value. So all the pixels that are kind of reddish um, from the zero point towards east, which is the yellow, all of those are going to just turn straight into a 1, whereas everything else will be false because it's greater than 90 all the way through to 360. That's all false. So if I take a look at it, I end up with something like this. And uh, we use Boolean rasters when we want to do kind of usually multiple criteria evaluations or we want to uh, only identify places that matter to us. And so Boolean is just, again, we have no data. Zero is this turquoise color, and um, orange is one, or the true. In older versions of Q, sometimes no data is the no value. But in most, uh, I think, updated versions of Q, zero is the no value, and one is the true value. So Boolean rasters can be very, very useful and powerful when we're doing raster overlay. Now, I'm going to ask you kind of a trick question here, and I'm going to ask you, what is this type of data set? And what I'm hoping you can say now is that, well, this can't be one data set. I'm, I'm sure it's two data sets. There is a hill shade and a digital elevation model that is being symbolized um, using a hypsometric tint. And these two combined together with transparency gives us the feeling of topography, um, but it's not just one data set. It's two being blended together. And a lot of landscape and terrain cartography is figuring out how to blend data sets to make something look attractive. So uh, hopefully you pass the test. Now here's another one that you've seen before. And this is an integer raster where the number is a name that represents uh, land cover type. You've seen this before, but what I want to point out is the difference between this and this. And hopefully you can recognize that that this is an aerial image whereas this is a land cover raster and so what is the difference between an aerial image and a categorized nominal integer raster well if we wanted to make measurements off of this aerial image um, we don't have categories what we have is a field of RGB values where every pixel has a different reflectance of red and green and blue just like a camera so the camera on the satellite or the airplane 
And the image that we get from that says, yep, this is a very blue area, yep, this is a green area, and this is a white area. But the actual values in this image just represent color. They don't represent category. So people who do re remote sensing and, and that type of field turn a lot of these types of images into these types of images. So now we can say, oh yeah, well, this isn't just bluish, it's actually water. And we want to actually, let's say we want to measure this entire, you know, the area of this bay. We need to turn the image into a classified image, an integer classified image, in order to kind of make calculations on it. So just try to remember that. This is actually multiple bands. There are three images, red, green, and blue, mixing together to show us color. And we're not going to do a lot of multispectral types of analyses because that's more the realm of remote sensing. But that color image, we turn into a single band integer raster in which the integers are nominal and represent land cover values in this case. These colors are measured. These colors are assigned by a human and are fairly arbitrary. It is just the numbers that represent the category and we color the category blue for water because we think oceans should be blue and that it's helpful for our brains and water should be blue. So, good. I hope you got that. I have one more type of raster that I want to look at and it's another type of categorized raster. But the categories are going to be ordinal. So we worked with Boolean rasters where we decided what was important and kind of put some subjectivity in there. And this type of categorized raster is ordinal in which I've taken this elevation val these elevation values and kind of put them into buckets. I've said everybody that's below 50 meters is going to be equal to 1. Everybody between 50 and 100 is 2. Um, 100 and 150 is 3, 150, 200 is 4, and then white, the highest class, is 5. And who knows why I'm doing that. Maybe, um, maybe we're doing a habitat analysis for uh, a low-dwelling tree or that kind of thing, and maybe we give these different scores, and it's, you know, on our 10-point scale might be 10 and 8 and 5 and 0, whatever it is. Um, but you can see how if I say less than 50, um, this kind of zero value of sea level gets included in that, right? An ordinal raster is just usually used in, in a multiple criteria evaluation where we say um, we're going to score this, this, uh, this elevation model and classify it. Classified rasters like this usually come from continuous rasters and then we give them classes to be a part of. And there are many reasons to do this, but I just want you to be able to recognize that this is a different raster from that. And the only way we get rasters like this is by manually kind of deciding which goes into which class. So a classified raster can be, um, it can be kind of nominal, where we say this means forest, this means that. But it can also be ordinal, and we say, well, this is number one, number two, number three, number four, number five.